Welcome to Tech Tales. I'm Corbin Davenport. And I'm Cody Toombs. And today we're talking about how Adobe Flash died and that it was probably Steve Jobs' fault. Or we can thank Steve Jobs. One of the two. Probably yeah, the latter. I'm, I'm choosing to thank him. Cody, what are your thoughts on Flash? Any feelings? Uh, absolute travesty of a technology. I get why it existed. I actually don't hate the goal of it. But it's so easy to point at everything that was wrong with it. We'll we'll get into a little bit of the history. I, I won't. This isn't a complete history of Adobe Flash. But there are parts of this where at the time I can see like, oh, in this brief moment in history, this was the best option for doing something. And then that time passed and then people kept using Flash. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But I, I can definitely say my my processor fans have to thank Steve Jobs for ending that that mess. Yeah. No longer does opening a web page mean that you're going to hear the whir of your fans. Well, shouldn't unless they're mining crypto. Yeah. I guess uh, I sh should briefly mention what Flash is. So how would you describe Flash, Cody, if someone asks you what the heck this is? Uh, I think the shortest version, it, probably the easiest version to go with, is Flash was a cross-platform runtime environment that operated like most other programming languages, but it was a little bit more script-oriented. Not to say it wasn't compiled, but it it was a little bit of a simpler language. And it became incredibly popular as a plugin for websites. Yes. Or, sorry, a browser plugin. So uh, since it was cross-platform and a browser plugin, it became infinitely popular as the option for doing anything complicated on a web page. That and also restaurant menus. Yes, that's a that's a good summary. It's uh it's very kind <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the the unkind comments are coming so before we get to how steve jobs helped wipe flash from the face of this earth we have to talk a little bit about how flash came to be and why it was not great what would become Flash was originally developed by a company called Future Wave Software, and it was called Smart Sketch. And Smart Sketch was a vector drawing application for pen computers, first released in 1993. So, wasn't an animation, wasn't a web plugin, it was just a vector drawing application, like we have today. Like Illustrator? Yeah, yeah, it's like, Illust it's like primitive Illustrator. So it started off as this vector drawing application, and then Smart Sketch later reworked it. They added frame by frame animation features, and it became Future Splash Animator for Mac and PC. And this was a little bit more popular. Honestly, never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I guess relative to Smart Sketch, because from what I gather, that was not popular whatsoever. Yeah, to be fair, I've never heard of either of them. So. Yeah, there weren't a lot of pen computers in 1993. True that. So then in 1996, Macromedia acquired Future Splash, and they split it into two products. There was now a graphics and animation editor, renamed Macromedia Flash, and a free player for those animations called Macromedia Flash Player. So now you could use Macromedia Flash to create animations and then play them uh, with Flash Player. Macromedia also created a browser plugin for Flash Player so websites could embed Flash animations. The plugin became really popular because Flash's vector graphics were usually quicker to download and load than compressed video because, you know, in the before times we didn't have fast internet speeds and it's a lot quicker to download a series of lines and text than it is to download compressed video, especially since we didn't have great video codecs back then. So all the video files were enormous. 
or they look like garbage. <laughs> to be fair, our video files didn't exactly get that much smaller. I mean, they did. Our codecs are definitely better today, but the practical reality is our storage space got bigger and yeah. our internet connections got faster. So, yeah. Yeah. So at this point, if you wanted to have some kind of animation on your website, you could either go with a compressed video file, which took a long time to download and probably looked like garbage if you wanted it to load within a reasonable amount of time for most people's internet connections, or you could just use flash. So a lot of people started using flash. So at this point, flash is still just entirely for animations. But eventually it starts to turn into a general purpose application platform. So in the year 2000, we get Flash 5.0, which adds the programming language action script for creating interactive components. So now Flash embedded objects can be interactive. You can have buttons that do things um, and games are now possible. So games made in Flash helped boost Flash's popularity at this point. So much so that Macromedia said in 2005 that Flash Player was installed on more than 98% of computers connected to the internet. Which is, that's that's crazy. <laughs> like, I remember Flash being everywhere, but 98% is, is impressive. We are talking about kind of the burgeoning, I, I guess, widespread use of computers. And at that time, I mean... Flash was one of the only things that ran on both Mac and Windows. And I don't remember if Linux was in the list yet. I know it eventually would be, but... And the only other thing that was really trying to be that was Java. And people had widely already decided Java was terrible. At least for that purpose. No one was making games in Java except Minecraft. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And one of the big factors here, too, is Java really wasn't UI oriented. Uh, it did have frameworks, but none of them were ever really that good. But Flash, Flash was UI first. I mean, that was the purpose of, of Flash, was to present a UI and ActionScript was your programming language. You didn't have... It Like, you could have things that didn't have a UI, but typically nobody's using Flash unless the idea was to present some sort of interface. That same year in 2005, Adobe purchases Macromedia and continues development under the new name Adobe Flash. And Doom was spelled for all. Yeah. So, skipping ahead a little bit to 2007 is when Apple releases the original iPhone, which includes the first mobile version of the Safari web browser. And Safari was one of the biggest selling points for this original iPhone because there was no app store at this point. That wouldn't come until 2008. So the only way you could use software that didn't come with the phone was through Safari. So Apple intended for people to make web apps using the then new HTML5 open standard. So these web apps, you know, just like today where you go to a website on your phone and it is presented sort of more as an application than a website. Safari on the original iPhone was really cool, but there was one big catch and it was that Apple did not support any web plugins on Safari for the iPhone. So there was no Java, there was no Shockwave, and there was no Adobe Flash. This ended up being a pretty common complaint with the original iPhone because at this point in 2007, so many websites rely on Flash, not just for media playback, but some websites, I, I, I certainly remember this, some websites would just not show you anything if you didn't have Flash installed. Like all the, all the navigation, everything, the entire website was a single Flash object. Yep. Yeah, it was almost as bad as visiting any website today with Internet Explorer 6. You're probably just going to get nothing or just a little warning saying, hey, by the way, you're behind. We don't care about you anymore. We're done with you. Or it's sort of like on a modern browser if you turn off JavaScript. You just, <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Not really anything works. 
Early on, Apple doesn't really seem interested in ever supporting Flash, but Adobe is really pushing for it because obviously it's in Adobe's best interest if Flash is on every platform possible. In March 2008, Apple CEO Steve Jobs said at an investors meeting that desktop Flash Player would be too slow for the iPhone, while the mobile-focused Flash Player Lite was, quote, not capable of being used with the web, quote. It makes sense, because at that time, the mobile player really was very, very hamstrung. It didn't have a lot of the features. There, there were things that it could do, but it would be kind of... I'm trying to think of a good comparison point, but... The iPhone's web capabilities, I believe, would be about on par with what Flash Player Lite could do. Like, you're not really gaining Roughly. anything. Yeah. I mean, there there was still a little bit more that it could do. I mean, Action Script wasn't completely out of the mobile player. So you, you could do things with that that you couldn't quite yet do with JavaScript, but... You know, we're we're talking about the stage where JavaScript was still in its not early days, but messy days. There, messy is really the only way. It is such a perfect word to describe all of this, uh, because everyone was still frantically trying to figure out how to how to do a lot with a web page, and then when you add mobile to the equation, and we're talking mobile processors that can't chew up a lot of data, at least at that time and battery life that was pretty horrible you threw flash even even the, uh their light version it, you throw any of that stuff together and it's it just destroyed a phone yeah the only benefit to bringing that to the iphone would be if your stuff was in flash then it could work across everything just like it did on the desktop but it would work across everything equally poorly <laughs> After Apple released the first iPhone app SDK in 2008, Adobe's chief executive said, quote, We have evaluated the software developer tools and we think we can develop an iPhone Flash player ourselves. So in 2008, when we get the first iPhone app store, Adobe sees the development kit and they're like, oh, we can just make Flash ourselves. We don't need Apple's permission. <laughs> Whoops. So Adobe's approach here is a little bit different because obviously they have to work with Apple to some extent to get a Flash plugin for Safari on the iPhone, but Apple's not interested in doing that. So they start going with a different approach where they work on this tool where if you have a Flash game or something that's basically an entire application in Flash, then you can compile that to an iPhone app and then publish that to the app store. So that's that's their solution to no flash plugin is it doesn't really help the people who want a flash plugin for websites, but if you a company have services or a, basically a full application written in flash, you can now compile that to an iPhone app and submit that to the app store. Um, so that's Adobe's solution to this. Yeah, to put it another way, what is having you do is include the entire Flash framework with your application. That way, it, you may not have everything happening through a web page, but your whole application is built. It is running on Flash. It, but yeah, there's no universal plugin included. You're just you're just including the Flash framework and hoping that's good enough. So, Cody, I'm sure you know. Every year, Adobe does a sort of product announcement event they call adobe max oh very well yes yeah so adobe max in 2008 is i believe when they show off this iphone compiling tool for the first time and uh, this is this is kind of funny at that event they show a video that they commissioned which is a parody of mythbusters uh that makes fun of apple for not letting them put flash on the iphone the two main people in this video were uh, an Adobe vice president and Adobe chief technology officer, Kevin Lynch. And that last person uh, now works at Apple. So it's very funny now <laughs> to watch this. <laughs> I think I think Kevin Lynch works on the Apple Watch, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah. Every company insisted on having their top executives 
doing goofball things that didn't necessarily work. Uh, I, I mean, I, Apple still does this. <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm specifically thinking back to BlackBerry and having their executive team start a band. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, oh no is right. Yeah. So we're going to watch this parody video together because it's funny. So I will send you the link. Press play on three, two, one, go. Welcome to another episode of Myth Hackers. We got another great show today. What are we going to cover this time? Well, this week's myth comes all the way from Silicon Valley. Steve from Cupertino has written us because he's heard that it's not possible to run Flash on the iPhone, and frankly, he just can't believe it. Kevin, there's got to be an app for that. Well, that's what we're here to find out. The iPhone has been constructed with state-of-the-art technology. It therefore seems reasonable that it should be able to run Flash, the state-of-the-art for engaging experiences across the web. Time to bring in the expert. So what's your perspective on Flash and the iPhone? You know, Flash runs on everything. It runs on desktops, it runs in browsers, it runs even on boats and planes. But I can't get it to run on, a, on an iPhone. Why is that? <sighs> Forget it, I'm out of here. Okay, so it's not looking like it's possible to run Flash on an iPhone. Well, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, now's about the time of the show when we want to take an iPhone and run a highly controlled set of specific experiments to rectify the situation. Okay, Kevin, let's get things started. I have the latest iPhone 3GS technology. Excellent. I have here the latest flash technology burned onto a CD-ROM. Let's combine them. Safety first. All right. All right, let it rip. Yeah, that doesn't look very good. Maybe it needs a little more juice. That wasn't supposed to happen. Hey, Johnny, I've got an idea. Let's ask a ninja. What kind of a stupid question is that? When you are a ninja, you do not need an iPhone. Yeah. Good. All right, fire in the hole. I think what we need to do here is actually really embed Flash into the phone. Not happening. That's a wrap, Kevin. Way to go. Okay, so we've tried just about every experiment imaginable. Apparently, this myth cannot be hacked. Kevin, I don't think iPhone can run Flash. Wait, I've got one more idea. Let's call Adobe. I know some people there. Hello, Adobe Engineering. We're doing some research on Flash and the iPhone. We're wondering if you can give us the straight story. Just recently, we've gotten it working for standalone applications. And in fact, there's Flash applications on the, uh, on the App Store today. Well, I guess there is an app for that. Yes, and as you can well see, Flash does run an iPhone now, so I think we can call this myth well and truly hacked. <laughs> oh, man. The reality of it is, at that time, one, that actually would that video probably went over super well because everybody obviously you're already playing to a crowd that's that's sitting there going hey this is what we're here for we love this yeah um, like this was made for their adobe max event so mm -hmm. it was just you know it, it was it was cheesy but i think it was close to the right amount of cheesy in a weird way i kind of wish they had called out apple a little harder it, it, maybe maybe just just go full shade and imply that the iPhone just wasn't good enough for Flash. But the problem with that is, to be fair, they would have that would have also been saying, hey, our tool that we just wrote and are going to recommend to everybody. Yeah, the, the iPhone's not going to be good enough to run that. So you shouldn't bother like that would be the implication. So they couldn't have said that. But that would have been the right way to really egg on apple so yeah if if anyone wants to watch this video the link to it and and all the other sources for this episode are in the show notes so you can go watch it um it's not on adobe's channel anymore but the company they commissioned to make it still has it on their youtube channel so shout out to them as they should yeah 
So Adobe's plans to create this compiling tool grind to a halt in April of 2010 when Apple updates the App Store publishing guidelines to ban applications built with third-party tools. So at this point, Apple's official way of making iPhone apps that they told people to do was you had to have a Mac, you had to use Xcode, and your iPhone apps had to be programmed in, I think, Objective-C. That's what they wanted. So Apple is now saying you have to make your apps that way. You can't use any other tools, including the Flash Player compiler that Adobe just made. Yep. That rule was straight up written for Adobe. It was made to be hostile. Yeah. So following that, Adobe filed a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission of the United States, which in turn began investigating Apple. Wired.com requested a copy of Adobe's complaint with a Freedom of Information Act request in May of 2010, but that information was later denied because the FTC said, quote, Disclosure of that material could reasonably be expected to interfere with the conduct of the commission's law enforcement activities, quote, <laughs> which is code for we might sue them. Yeah. As far as I could find, there's never an investigation for reasons we'll get into in a little bit. But if you think Apple's anti-competitive practices with the App Store started recently, you're very wrong. <laughs> This, this was two years after the iPhone uh, got an app store. It's funny because Apple wasn't even that far into having an app store, and they were already pissing off other major companies. That same month, Steve Jobs published an open letter on Apple's website called Thoughts on Flash. This is kind of the moment everything explodes with Flash on the iPhone. This letter is very long, and I'm going to read the whole thing, and I'm, I'm probably going to have to take <laughs> some <laughs> breaks here. <laughs> I'll send you the letter so you can read along. Oh, my God. I forgot how long this was. So, Steve Jobs said, Apple has a long relationship with Adobe. In fact, we met Adobe's founders when they were in their proverbial garage. Apple was their first big customer, adopting their PostScript language for our new laser writer printer. Apple invested in Adobe and owned around 20% of the company for many years. The two companies worked closely together to pioneer desktop publishing, and there were many good times. Since that golden era, the companies have grown apart. Apple went through its near-death experience, and Adobe was drawn to the corporate market with their Acrobat products. Today, the two companies still work together to serve their joint creative customers. Mac users buy around half of Adobe's Creative Suite products, but beyond that, there are very few joint interests. I wanted to jot down some of our thoughts on Adobe's Flash products so that customers and critics may better understand why we do not allow Flash on iPhones, iPods, and iPads. Adobe has characterized our design as being primarily business-driven. They say we want to protect our App Store, but in reality, it is based on technology issues. Adobe claims that we are a closed system and that Flash is open, but in fact, the opposite is true. Let me explain. First, there's quote-unquote open. Adobe's Flash products are 100% proprietary. They are only available from Adobe, and Adobe has sole authority as to their future enhancement, pricing, etc. While Adobe's Flash products are widely available, this does not mean that they are open, since they are controlled entirely by Adobe and only available from Adobe. By almost any definition, Flash is a closed system. Apple has many proprietary products too. Though the operating system for the iPhone, iPod, and iPad is proprietary, we strongly believe that all standards pertaining to the web should be open. Rather than use Flash, Apple has adopted HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript, all open standards. Apple's mobile devices all ship with high-performance, low-power implementations of these open standards. HTML5, the new web standard that has been adopted by Apple, Google, and many others, lets web developers create advanced graphics, topography, animation, and transitions without relying on third-party browser plugins like Flash. HTML5 is completely open and controlled by Standards Committee, of which Apple is a member. Apple even creates open standards for the web. For example, Apple began with a small open source project and created WebKit, a complete open source HTML5 rendering engine that is the heart of the Safari web browser and used in all of our products. WebKit has been widely adopted. 
Google uses it for Android's browser, Palm uses it, Nokia uses it, and Research in Motion, BlackBerry, has announced that they will use it too. Almost every smartphone web browser other than Microsoft's uses WebKit. By making its WebKit technology open, Apple has set the standard for mobile web browsers. Second, there's the quote-unquote full web. Adobe has repeatedly said that Apple mobile devices cannot access the full web because 75% of video on the web is Flash. What they don't say is that almost all of this video is also available in a more modern format, H.264, and viewable on iPhones, iPods, and iPads. YouTube, with an estimated 40% of the web's video, shines in an app bundled on all Apple mobile devices, with the iPad offering perhaps the best YouTube discovery and viewing experience ever. Add to this video from Vimeo, Netflix, Facebook, ABC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, ESPN, NPR, Time, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, People, National Geographic, and many, many others. iPhone, iPod, and iPad users aren't missing much video. Uh, to be fair, that's that list was already a little bit disingenuous because Netflix was either had already started pushing Silverlight or or at least they were exploring it. A couple of these other companies were actually still actively pushing Flash. Yeah. They only supported H.264 as kind of as kind of a backup that only targeted either newer devices or it was their fallback position, not their not the thing they were actually pushing first and foremost. Right. Flash was still the default on the desktop. And almost every one of these companies still had tons of Flash on their websites. Like, yeah. sure, even if the video was H.264 in some cases, it was still Flash running everything else. And, like, one thing I, I rediscovered while researching this that I'd completely forgotten about was that when YouTube first showed up on the iPhone, you couldn't actually watch all YouTube videos because YouTube had not gone back and re-encoded their entire video library for H.264. Yep. So there were a lot of videos where you try to watch it and it'd be like, oh, you can't watch it on your iPhone. Sorry. Yeah. If I remember, and I could have this wrong, but I think I remember YouTube made a big deal about that being the thing that finally got them to do re-encodes for however many different codecs and formats and device shapes and sizes like when they did that it was i believe because of the iphone that sounds about right moving on another adobe claim is that apple devices cannot play flash games this is true fortunately there are over fifty thousand games and entertainment titles on the app store and many of them are free there are more games and entertainment titles available for iPhone, iPod, and iPad than for any other platform in the world. Third, there's reliability, security, and performance. Symantec recently highlighted Flash for having one of the worst security records in 2009. We also know firsthand that Flash is the number one reason Macs crash. We have been working with Adobe to fix these problems, but they have persisted for several years now. We don't want to reduce the reliability and security of our iPhones, iPods, and iPads by adding Flash. In addition, Flash has not performed well on mobile devices. We have routinely asked Adobe to show us Flash performing well on a mobile device, any mobile device, for a few years now. We have never seen it. Adobe publicly said that Flash would ship on a smartphone in early 2009, then the second half of 2009, then the first half of 2010, and now they say the second half of 2010. We think it will eventually ship, but we're glad we didn't hold our breath. Who knows how it will perform? Fourth, there's battery life. To achieve long battery life when playing video, mobile devices must decode the video in hardware. Decoding it in software uses too much power. Many of the chips used in modern mobile devices contain a decoder called H.264, an industry standard that is used in every Blu-ray DVD player and has been adopted by Apple, Google, slash YouTube, Vimeo, Netflix, and many other companies. Although Flash has recently added support for H.264, the video on almost all Flash websites currently requires an older generation decoder that is not implemented in mobile chips and must be run in software. The difference is striking. On an iPhone, for example, 
H.264 videos play for up to 10 hours, while videos decoded in software play for less than 5 hours before the battery is fully drained. When websites re-encode their videos using H.264, they can offer them without using Flash at all. They play perfectly in browsers like Apple Safari and Google's Chrome without any plugins whatsoever and look great on iPhones, iPods, and iPads. Fifth, there's touch. Flash was designed for PCs using mice, not for touchscreens using fingers. For example, many Flash websites rely on rollovers, which pop up menus or other elements when the mouse arrow hovers over a specific spot. Apple's revolutionary multi-touch interface doesn't use a mouse and there is no concept of a rollover. Most Flash websites will still need to be rewritten to support touch-based devices. If developers need to rewrite their Flash websites, why not use modern technologies like HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript? Even if iPhones, iPods, and iPads ran Flash, it would not solve the problem that most Flash websites need to be rewritten to support touch-based devices. Sixth, the most important reason. Besides the fact that Flash is closed and proprietary, has major technical drawbacks, and doesn't support touch-based devices, there is an even more important reason why we do not allow Flash on iPhones, iPods, and iPads. We have discussed the downsides of using Flash to play video and interactive content from websites, but Adobe also wants developers to adopt Flash to create apps that run on our mobile devices. We know from painful experience that letting a third-party layer of software come between the platform and the developer ultimately results in a substandard app and hinders the enhancement and progress of the platform. If developers grow dependent on third-party development libraries and tools, they can only take advantage of platform enhancements if and when the third party chooses to adopt the new features. We cannot be at the mercy of a third party deciding if and when they will make our enhancements available to our developers. This becomes even worse if the third party is supplying a cross-platform development tool. The third party may not adopt enhancements from one platform unless they are available on all of their supported platforms. Hence, developers only have access to the lowest common denominator set of features. Again, we cannot accept an outcome where developers are blocked from using our innovations enhancements because they are not available on our competitors' platforms. Flash is a cross-platform development tool. It is not Adobe's goal to help developers write the best iPhone, iPod, and iPad apps. It is their goal to help developers write cross-platform apps. And Adobe has been painfully slow to adopt enhancements to Apple's platforms. For example, although Mac OS X has been shipping for almost 10 years now, Adobe just adopted it fully two weeks ago when they shipped CS5. Adobe was the last major third-party developer to fully adopt Mac OS X. Our motivation is simple. We want to provide the most advanced and innovative platform to our developers, and we want them to stand directly on the shoulders of this platform and create the best apps the world has ever seen. We want to continually enhance the platform so developers can create even more amazing, powerful, fun, and useful applications. Everyone wins. We sell more devices because we have the best apps, developers reach a wider and wider audience and customer base, and users are continually delighted by the best and broadest selection of apps on any platform. Conclusions Flash was created during the PC era for PCs and computer mice. Flash is a successful business for Adobe, and we can understand why they want to push it beyond PCs. But the mobile era is about low-power devices, touch interfaces, and open web standards, all areas where Flash falls short. The avalanche of media outlets offering their content for Apple's mobile devices demonstrates that Flash is no longer necessary to watch video or consume any kind of web content, and the 250,000 apps on Apple's App Store proves that Flash isn't necessary for tens of thousands of developers to create graphically rich applications, including games. New open standards created in the mobile era, such as HTML5, will win on mobile devices and PCs too. Perhaps Adobe should focus more on creating great HTML5 tools for the future, and less on criticizing Apple for leaving the past behind. Steve Jobs. Ah, uh, so much shade. So much shade. Here's the thing. As much as a lot of this letter is in various ways hypocritical, I mean, it, almost everything, actually, I think literally every single thing that Steve Jobs says in this letter can actually be referenced back to other things that Apple itself is guilty of. Or need I mention how Apple pushed iTunes on Windows 
in the most devastatingly terrible quality of software and it it did not apply any of the common sense programming paradigms it was inefficient it it did all the bad things yeah like i think if i remember correctly itunes for windows was basically like a wrapper for the mac version like it was using mac os x apis and was just sort of like haphazardly ported to windows okay it's a little more complicated than this but for simple terms so nobody at me over the fact that i'm glossing over it but in essence they basically created a runtime not an emulator but a but a runtime that included all of apple's primary apis and they re-implemented that to to run in their own thing that way you could have itunes as one code base and then you effectively had a translating layer for windows it's like oh you're telling me that instead of putting in the work to rewrite (laughs) your application for the platform you're on you just took your existing code base and put it in a poorly performing runtime i see yeah (laughs) yeah and uh, like apple is apple is famous for having flaunted various open standards or at least standards in general i mean need we point to firewire Uh, the list goes on and on and on like to the point of almost comical absurdity it's like that meme of all the comic book spider-mans pointing at each other like that's adobe and apple yeah (laughs) like they're they're all doing the same thing just in different areas but with all that said as hypocritical as this letter is, the absolute truth of it is everything Steve Jobs is saying here, minus the little bit of hyperbole at the end, it is all dead on. Yeah. Every criticism here is exactly right. Flash ran terribly on, I mean, it ran terribly on desktops. Throwing it on mobile, terrible idea. Anything that was developed in Flash, it was generally designed with with mouse use in mind it was never designed with touch uh and a few things worked i mean i remember running this on android and legitimately there were things that worked but not much and it was a huge pain to get a lot of stuff working Uh, security was (laughs) oh god i remember like at that time if you watch tech news it was about once a month (laughs) <laughs> there would be a i'm not even exaggerating yeah about once a month there would be a new story of hey uh you everyone should probably disable their flash plugin because there's some new thing if you if if you even browse to a website that has flash and flash is allowed to load like there's a chance that they can do remote code execution on your device like t- bad remote code outside of the browser remote code execution like it, there were just so many stories about security issues and yeah the list really goes on all of the every single complaint here that steve jobs has about flash is dead on it's just so funny though that it's all the same stuff apple was also already guilty of yeah your point of all this being true was sort of my main takeaway too where This letter was such a big deal at the time, like it has its own Wikipedia article right now. And with that, you would expect that this would be like controversial in some way, but it's really not. Like, even though we have the hindsight of being a decade after this happening, and now we can look back and go, wow, Flash was terrible. Even then, like nothing in this letter was like terribly wrong. Flash didn't run well. It was a security risk. It was bad on mobile. It was bad on touchscreens. There really wasn't anything in this letter that was like, whoa, Apple's completely wrong here. Really, the only bits of information that's sort of new or maybe unexpected is that tidbit about Flash being the number one reason Macs crash, which is kind of interesting. As a fairly recent Mac user myself, when I read that, not even for a second did I doubt it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh no it checks out and that's not entirely fair i think there were actually some other pretty notorious reasons for crashes but yeah flash without question was one of the leading however there was one thing that steve jobs did not mention in this letter that we did not find out until 2021 
is that Apple was working with Adobe at one point to bring Flash to the iPhone and iPad. So Scott Forstall, former head of software engineering for Apple, said in a deposition for Apple's lawsuit with Epic Games that Flash on iPhone was a complete dumpster fire. Again, that Apple versus Epic Games lawsuit just gives us so much drama about the tech industry from the past 10 years, and I love it. The gift that keeps on giving. Thank you, Epic. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, Epic. I'm going to read his full quote. He said, quote, We did not ship Flash. We tried to make Flash work. We helped Adobe. We were definitely interested. Again, this is one where I thought that if we could help make it work, this could be great. Flash has been such a problem because the way it hooks into systems, it's been a virus nightmare on Windows, even on the Mac. And we got it running on iOS, but the performance was just abysmal and embarrassing, and it could never get to something which would be a value add for consumers. So there's someone who was trying very hard to get Flash on the iPhone, and he called it abysmal. (laughs) We are talking about, especially at that time period, though it's still obviously true today, Apple was all about finding competitive edges. And you could easily point to Flash at that time as one of those things that ideally you would want to have on your phone because it was a competitive edge. It was a way to say, here's a thing, if, if they could get it working well, here's a thing on our platform that you can't do on someone else's as well or effectively or efficiently. So yeah, they had every incentive to try to make it work. It was just doomed. And especially because Safari for the iPhone was a huge selling point. And they they really hyped up the fact that like this was the full web. But then people still complain when there wasn't Flash. So that letter caused some mayhem. Adobe wasn't happy. Adobe's chief executive called the letter a, quote, extraordinary attack, quote. I believe there was an interview with business insider or something i don't know it was one of the newspapers that has a paywall so i couldn't actually read the article i was reading um the guardian's coverage of this interview and adobe's chief executive denied accusations about flash training battery power which okay buddy (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's very easily verifiable fact at this point that flash reduced battery life on pc and mac laptops like this was not (laughs) <laughs> couldn't really fight him on that one buddy i'm sorry i you don't want to call it a lie because you don't know if somebody genuinely just doesn't know but maybe maybe the engineers never told him this was a well-known thing but yeah it was a well-known thing i know in this interview he tried to make the case that like flash itself wasn't really draining battery it was just the fact that Flash was used for these complex animations and video stuff that itself drained battery. But right. like again, Steve Jobs kind of addressed that with the point that when you use video codecs that the hardware supports, this is not an issue. So, you know, w- whatever. He also said in the interview that if Flash was truly the number one reason for Mac crashes, that is, quote, something to do with the Apple operating system, quote. That that that's a that's a take. I, that I, is a daring I, way to go. Yeah, yeah, I've never heard of a software developer blaming the fact that a computer can allow their software to crash for the reason why their software crashes. That's pretty incredible. I mean, you say that, but we just did we just did two long series about OS two and and Mac OS both of which used to have notorious crashing problems that had everything to do with their own software. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So a few months later, in September of 2010, Apple reversed course, and they started allowing developers to create iOS apps with third-party programming languages and tools again. As I mentioned earlier, this was probably done to fight off possible antitrust violations and like the FTC suing them. But regardless for the reason, it allowed apps created with Adobe Flash to enter the App Store again. Apple said at the time, quote, We are relaxing all restrictions on the development tools used to create iOS apps as long as the resulting apps do not download any code. This should give developers the flexibility they want while preserving the security we need. So technically, Flash apps can now be on the iPhone, but they still can't 
download other resources themselves, which is a requirement that I believe continues on Apple App Store to this day. It, this did end up meaning that you still couldn't use Flash from a browser. You still could only use it for fully created applications. Right. Apple, yeah, Apple wasn't letting plugins on Safari still. It it was still just for companies who had software in Flash. They could now port that to be a standalone iPhone application. Which really still didn't solve the problem for most people. No. And by this point, developers were starting to switch to HTML5 more and, and H.264 video. It's still a messy decision to have even allowed this, but it is understandable. Again, it, it almost certainly happened because Apple Apple knew it was facing potential uh, litigation and other legal issues. So yeah, they did it to save their necks, kind of. Yeah. So while all this is going on on the iPhone, Adobe has been bringing Flash Player to other mobile platforms. So it's on Android, like you mentioned before. It was released for Symbian, which was Nokia's platform before they switched to Windows Phone. I think it was on Windows Phone. I'm not sure. I don't know if it was on BlackBerry Phones, but it was on the BlackBerry Playbook, which was their tablet. So it was on other platforms. It was not good on any of them. All very true. Yeah. Like I, I remember using Flash a little bit on my Android tablet because I would use that Android tablet for school stuff. A lot of websites I had to go to for homework assignments or something had Flash video or Flash animations. It like kind of sort of worked, but it was because I had the keyboard attachment for my tablet that had a touchpad on it. So I could just, you know, use it like a PC. So it didn't matter if it didn't work with touch, but it was still not great. Flash had basically been shot down for iPhones and they were pushing it out to other platforms. The funny thing is, this was still actually a legitimately big selling point. I remember this one trip that I took. I I was working at a winery at the time and it, it was for this wine festival. A few of the other people that worked there, we all tr were traveling together. And I sat there with a brand new... AT&T Inspire 4G, which was HTC's Desire HD, but packaged for AT&T. Anyway, I'm showing off this phone to people. And legitimately, one of these selling points was, look at this, I can load websites with Flash. As much as I hated Flash, I, I would tell anyone all day long, Flash is terrible. But at the same time, I, I would still sit there and say, you know what? You still need it to get a lot of pages and... Here it is. It works here. It doesn't work on an iPhone. And this was legitimately one of the things that convinced other people to switch to Android. Yeah, like I think everyone acknowledged, except Adobe, that Flash was awful, but it was a necessary evil in this sort of transition stage for the web where not everything was HTML5 yet, but we were getting there. But Flash was kind of needed in the meantime. And it was it was a long transition. I mean, you know... But from this story alone, we're talking about uh, the first slap that Apple made against Flash was in twenty or 2008. And then the letter happens in 2010. Uh, this, the incident I'm talking about didn't happen until 2011. I mean, we're now, this is now a few years down the road and Flash is still a legitimate selling point. Yeah. So actually in that year, 2011 is when Adobe officially gave up on Flash for mobile devices, or at least a Flash web plugin. They were still doing their packaging thing. They said in an announcement, quote, Our future work with Flash on mobile devices will be focused on enabling Flash developers to package native apps with Adobe Air for all the major app stores. We will no longer adapt Flash Player for mobile devices to new browsers, OS versions, or device configurations. Some of our source code licensees may opt to continue working on and releasing their own implementations. We will continue to support the current Android and Playbook configurations with critical bug fixes and security updates. Quote. And did they? <laughs> dump, dump, dump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they. It's it's so funny. From the time the like you said, from the time the iPhone was released to 2010, Adobe was 
pushing very hard to make Flash Player a thing. And a year after Steve Jobs' letter in 2011, they're like, okay, we're done with Flash on everything mobile. We're done. To be fair, they didn't have a lot of choice. No. I mean, it it was one of those things where even if people were legitimately switching to Android because of this or other platforms in theory, the fact is Flash was Flash was doing poorly. Uh, if I recall, and I might have this wrong, I think even Google or one of the browsers... One of the browsers, I'm, I feel like it was Google, had even said, we're going to start phasing out Flash. I know when, when Google released the first version of Chrome for Android, they did not allow Flash. So right. when, you know, before this point, Android just sort of had a generic web browser that was WebKit. And when they make mm-hmm. the first version of, of the Chrome browser, at that point, they say, no, we're not supporting Flash. Yeah. So again, by this point, the Flash browser plugin is falling out of popularity on desktop platforms. You know, we, we've gone over a lot of the reasons why Flash was bad, but at this point in 2011, like it's just becoming intolerable. <laughs> Websites that used Flash were often difficult to navigate and broke the browser's back button. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like if you click back, your browser's like, oh, so we're going back to the last page, right? No, 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 no. What we're interacting with is inside Flash. One thing that I didn't know anything about before researching this was that Flash was not always accessible to people with disabilities because Flash content usually didn't work with screen readers and mouse-free tools. So I like how you say usually. Oh no, it was all the time. I, yeah, well, I, I say that because like I know for a very long time it did not work at all. I think Adobe finally addressed that very late in Flash's lifetime. But yeah, for a long time, like... If you needed a screen reader, oh, you're just out of luck if a website really needed Flash. Like, you're just not using the website. Yeah. Also, Flash video playback trailed behind HTML5 with hardware-accelerated decoding, which, like Steve Jobs said, this is really important for improving performance, which means you can play higher-quality video files, and reducing battery drain. So kind of through this time, Adobe is very slowly adding hardware decoding to Adobe Flash, but... Again, like everyone's switching to just normal HTML5 by this point. It, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, the, the ship sailed. And again, like Steve Jobs said, because Flash wasn't an open standard, Adobe had control over much of the web for as long as Flash remained relevant. So that was enough to try to get browsers to move to something else. I know you, you talked about this a little bit already, but Flash had hundreds of known security vulnerabilities over its lifetime many of which allowed code to break out of the Flash container and execute on the host computer. Uh, I read about at least one that could take control of the computer's webcam without the person's knowledge. Um, so, yeah, just one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there might have been a couple of those. I, I, didn't, I didn't read about it fully. Also, you said hundreds. Oh, it was <laughs> thousands, tens of thousands. Flash was literally famous as like the security exploit target it yeah. was the place you if you were a hacker trying to break into anything you went to flash it because it had the most permission of almost anything in the system short of the os itself and it it was it, on everything was, like you, yeah, yeah like, it was on everything and it had holes everywhere yeah now in total fairness to adobe which is a sentence i have not said before <laughs> Modern web browsers also have pretty frequent security vulnerabilities. Like if you go look at the list of security fixes in every new release of Google Chrome, there's a lot. And some and occasionally yeah. they do find a what are called zero day exploits, which is where they find the security exploit after it has been proven that it's being used by hackers to to do bad things. However, that's that's less of an issue now because number one, web browsers are very good at auto updating. So as soon as a fix is implemented, it can be rolled out to basically everyone within a matter of days. I I think if I remember correctly, Flash would like tell you there's an update available, but it was still up to you to actually do the update. Yep. Flash was the good old fashioned, um, you had to run an installer to update it. Yeah. So yeah, you, I don't remember if this was true all the way to the end, but for many, many years, Every time there was an update, it would tell you, you would download it, run the installer, and do the the thing. 
which led to the infamous your flash plugin is out of date notices that would pop up and tell people this and calm them into downloading an installer for something that had nothing to do with flash which persists to this day i still see these on websites from time to time yeah well i guess technically if you don't have flash player installed then your flash version is out of date right (laughs) you're not wrong (laughs) oh geez yeah so like web browsers today are a little bit better with rolling out fixes as soon as they're available also we just have generally better container technology now so it's harder for websites to break out of their container and execute code on the computer and also in theory because there are multiple browser engines if a flaw is found in one of them it doesn't immediately mean that all windows and mac computers connected to the internet can be hacked but at this point google's chromium engine has like 80 percent market share or something so we're kind of back to that point anyway but you know (laughs) good times yeah Getting rid of Flash did not remove the capability for there to be damaging exploits on the web. But now it's easier for us to deal with this because we don't have to wait for a single company to release an update for their browser plugin and then wait for everyone to click accept on the update. Finally, Adobe fully discontinued Flash Player and I believe Windows actually pushed an update at the same time that removed flash from your computer if it was still installed like this was a this was a total shutdown like do not put do not leave this on your computer (laughs) Um, yeah it was a coordinated ending of flash yeah like adobe said this would happen at least a year or two in advance Um, everyone had updates ready to go on december 31st to wipe this from existence i i know that like flash is still like you can still find and install flash if you really need it but Flash player, as most people know it, is dead now. So one of the biggest problems is that uh, schools and hospitals and all these other institutions that paid to have custom software developed often had it developed in Flash. And so tons of schools actually lost all these learning resources and they couldn't they couldn't make this stuff available they lost tons of tools. Lots of stuff never got rebuilt after Flash was torn down. And it's understandable, you know. It's not like this was a thing that shouldn't have happened, but it was not the most elegant ending. Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, like they could have open sourced it and let other people take over development. But as as much as the early web relied on Flash, so we did lose you know a lot of early flash games and a lot of websites even if they're archived are harder to use now and many many restaurant menus yeah all those poor <laughs> restaurant menus but like it it it, it, it kind of needed to be a band-aid that had to be ripped off very quickly so yeah that's that's flash and that's how steve jobs probably was the main factor in it dying besides the uh whole lot of security flaws (laughs) (laughs) aside from all the damage flash did to itself yeah (laughs) steve jobs buried the buried the hammer steve jobs was the primary external factor (laughs) yeah it was a lot of work on apple's part to really make this letter come together there are stories of how much effort apple had to go through in making sure that they really nailed this down and i mean we're talking about a letter that had to be relatively flawless because again you're you are bucking a trend you're basically telling the world hey this thing that you all use you all depend on yeah we're just not going to do it okay like tough cookies that's how it's going to be and you know apple worked hard to make that a a compelling argument 